Okay. So I think we can start, sir. All right. So, um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy that we are having uh, our department's uh, first webinar. Uh, I welcome all of you to this series, uh, which is we're calling it the Abadi series. Uh, we are hoping that we'll have four of them. This is the first in the series. And it is mainly based on the urban design exercise that our students have done in their fourth year. And though I think DTC has done several uh, webinars already with various departments, this is the first in the Department of Architecture. And uh, this is a very relevant topic because uh, we find that urban villages are very unique and very significant, yet they are very, well, very much re relegated. And uh, there is very little talk about uh, them. Uh, and uh, perhaps you know that much before Connaught Place, there was Abita Ganj and uh, before there was GK, there was Amrutpur. Similarly, I think before there was Noida, there was Bangal, Musharpur. But unlike you had heard of Noida, Greater Kalash, you had perhaps never heard of Zamrudpur or Husharpur or Bangal. Because I think uh, those names uh, that gave the uh, place and identity have been uh, subsumed within the overall urban uh, sprawl uh, that came about later. Uh, and I think uh, they were really relegated to the background and became the backyard for the new development that came around. Uh, a new model that was uh, that replaced uh, these urban villages that had exist existed there for centuries, and uh, this is a this is not a unique feature. There are several urban villages all over the world, which I hope that Manishilana Professor will talk about. Uh, but uh, in our context, these were the places that first gave the identity to several of these regions. And these were also the areas that gave, gave, uh, were, gave the first economic and social infrastructure to the new development uh, that came. Uh, anybody who has sort of uh, lived in these new development areas, all your shopping, all your daily needs, uh, photocopy or uh, for that matter service sectors repair electrical shops everything happens there so they become like uh, basically an economic cushion to these new development and perhaps because of the new development that comes around uh, these areas also then start aspiring uh, to become like them and i think at the end of the day they lose uh, everything that they had uh, and uh, unfortunately, because they're not part of the overall uh, planning uh, uh, framework, they remain neglected and uh, they don't even benefit from the urban development that is happening around them. And that's why the new planning around, uh, it does, I think, uh, uh, benefits and upgrades, but these areas then become uh, relegated areas or uh, sometimes even cesspools and people don't tend to either go to them or even be associated with them. They become like really like the shadow areas of uh, uh, our cities. Uh, so based on this particular perception for the last four years uh, under Professor Anand Khatri who used to be our faculty, we started to look at these urban villages in Noida to look what is special in them, uh, uh, why are they worthy to be studied, what, what are the lessons we can learn about urban development in these areas. And we were very happy that uh, there were several things uh, that we found, which uh, I'm sure uh, you will know more in details from Professor Khatri's presentation. And we found that they were really the repository of a low, lost uh, planning systems, traditional architecture, and a lot of things that we talk or read in books are still very much alive. They are continuing traditions, even in their most uh, relegated form or the most uh, uh, morphed form that they exist uh, uh, today. 
uh, also i think unlike the urban villages in our uh, context which which become uh, the areas of blight or are uh, which where somehow the developments uh, passes on them uh this this particular uh, concept is quite sought after i happened to live when i was in uk in an urban village uh, very close to a place called telford and they are quite sought after areas i mean they they have special norms they have uh, special uh, somebody saying voice is not audible okay is the voice not audible to everyone i mean i don't know Sir, it's audible. I think. I think uh, maybe that particular person had yeah, uh, yeah. a problem with his hand. Uh, so maybe, uh, Mitesh, you can tell him that maybe he can check. So there are sought after concepts in at least in UK and some other developing countries or, or developed countries where people tend to live there because they're outskirts. The the people uh, run away from the pollution, the hustle bustle, the stress of an urban life. so they do tend to work in these urban areas but they tend to live uh, several people in the urban villages and they have um, special guidelines these are areas with or with uh, special provisions where there is uh, agricultural uh, practices or uh, environmental uh, controls so then there are there are areas of um, importance or significance and not uh, areas of blight like we uh, know of them here and in that context we would like to then hear from professor manish chilana who is going to give us a overview of our perspective on urban villages uh, in an international um, uh, context and uh, i hope that uh, this dialogue that we have initiated will uh, help putting the urban villages in context uh, telling about their significance in our uh, overall uh, urban development context maybe some guidelines or special provisions here could also be developed um, based on the dialogues that we would initiate or have uh, here so that uh, i think they can in a way retain their uniqueness and yet modernize and yet uh reap the benefits of the urban development that is happening around them but without sort of losing their identity uh and uh, so i would uh, again like in the in the end like to thank uh, everyone to join uh, especially professor manish chalana and professor khatri who we are doing this um, the webinar uh, uh, webinar in collaboration with uh, uvct his new organization and we hope that uh, 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 together we can give an architectural voice to these urban villages and we hope that we have a productive uh, session and the series uh, and with that i would now like to invite uh, mr aman sahani our vice chairman of dtc to formally inaugurate and uh, say a few words uh, over to you aman thank you and um, very happy that i'm part of this first webinar of the school of architecture uh, like you mentioned there've been a few webinars before but then in architecture this is the first one that we're doing and i'm sure that we'll do many more and um, they'll be extremely successful hopefully all of them and um, this this virus that we are facing globally right now has given us uh, i believe an opportunity to 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 create uh new ways to innovate to establish new the new normal of um, conducting these webinars and other exercises that do not require us to be present physically and that's great opportunity for us to collaborate to for us to um um further the cause of learning of of updating ourselves keeping ourselves busy in very productive ways so so that is what we've been trying to do um not only in dtc but also the other organizations that are part of our setup uh, which is basically two schools and two colleges and in all four we've tried to adapt very quickly to this new method of education because um the first thing that comes to my mind is that we don't want anyone to waste their time anyone who's who's part of our setup the faculty the students even the outside community uh, who can engage with us we want them to remain 
engaged and we want them to benefit as much as they can out of uh, this process of education. So uh, with that in mind, we've started quite a few webinars in, um, in all the courses, in all the schools, and uh, they've, been, they've received uh, good feedback. So it's a very positive exercise and I hope we can keep that, uh, we can continue with that. And this method of engaging everyone through technology is something that's here to stay, COVID or no COVID. So I think it's best if we adapt to it very quickly, if we uh, make the best use of it as, as it has a lot of potential. And um, the main thing, which is, which is this webinar also is a case in point, is that it gives us tremendous opportunity for collaboration. And everyone's sort of, uh, at this point, in any case, facing similar problems in the same boat. And um, everyone can be in the same, um, can have the same objective of, um, of, of looking at a lot of issues that are there in our society and uh, try and solve them as best we can. So that's the idea behind all of these webinars that they've been doing well and I hope we continue with them. The, the other great thing about this series in particular is that it, um, it concerns our immediate community, our immediate uh, surroundings, the city of Noida in this case, uh, which is also something that is an, a broader objective of our society, of our trust, that we want to engage in our community, we want to work for their betterment. And um, for example, one of the villages I believe is part of this, we've also taken up that village as a legal aid center. So as part of our law courses, we, we've established a legal aid center in Hoshiapur and are working with several of the issues that the residents of that village are, are facing because they, they don't have adequate um, legal counsel, legal help. So it is, it is very much a part of our broader objective of working with our immediate community and trying to work for their welfare and benefit and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great initiative. I wish everyone the best of luck. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Aman. Uh, now I would uh, request uh, Professor Ranjit Verma, uh, Director Institute, uh, DTC, uh, to give his welcome address, please. Sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Deva Gupta ji. Uh, I welcome all the distinguished guests, all the participants, and uh, all the students who have joined today for this uh, webinar. Uh, as is being rightly said uh, uh, by our chairman, sir, that uh, this webinar, this type of series has given us an opportunity uh, where uh, interdisciplinary expertise come together and then we can listen to one another and think about and work uh, in a way where we can collaborate and persons from different fields, uh, uh, different areas and different places can join and discuss uh, on a problem uh, which can be uh, where we can have the views and express and uh, an expertise of different persons and we can benefit from them. So this is uh, one of the first uh, webinars in this series, uh, which has been organized by the Department of Architecture in the technical campus. Uh, we have organized uh, around seven or eight uh, such type of webinars in uh, different departments, in computer science and uh, civil and etc. department. But this is the first webinar uh, in architecture department. And hopefully, I hope that uh, the uh, several such webinars will be there in future. Uh, I welcome all the distinguished guests. I welcome Professor Dr. Manish Chalana, who uh, is the associate professor with the University of Washington. I hope that uh, by his presence today, we will benefit and the, all the students in the faculty will, uh, will learn a lot uh, by his words and by his, by his expertise. I welcome uh, Professor Anand Khatriji, who was a part of DTC a short time back and he was working and uh, I remember there was a discussion between uh, uh, with him where we were discussing to have a national conference regarding this topic, but it, it couldn't materialize. Uh, so I hope that uh, with this webinar, uh, we can, uh, uh, we will, we will take it forward. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, such a conference will be, uh, will happen in near future. So once again, I welcome all the uh, participants, all the faculty members, all the students, and uh, I wish all the success to this webinar. And uh, I 
thank Professor Divya Gupta for arranging such a good webinar. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, uh, Aman. Thank you, Professor Verma, uh, for these encouraging words uh, and also very relevant uh, that you pointed uh, about the particular circumstances that we are facing today. And I find that, you know, the, uh, it is not only about the webinar, but also the topic that uh, then in the time of crisis, we, all, we are also looking at alternative ways of doing things, you know, and then a lot of these solutions seems to be already existing in our traditional knowledge system. And I think that urban villages also is part of that knowledge system. So I think uh, maybe there they would be certain learnings uh, in our architecture and planning in these uh, aspects that we don't tend to learn. Uh, so I will now hand over uh, to Amitesh to uh, start uh, the formal presentations. Over to Amitesh. Thank you so much, sir. Today, our first speaker is Professor Anand Khatri. And uh, here's a short bio about Sir. Professor Anand Khatri completed his BR from GCA in 1993 and MR in Architectural Conservation from SPA in 1996. He's an architect and professor of urban design. Uh, he is also trained in pranic healing and theosophy. With his interest in poetry, healing, and spirituality, his book, 21 Seasons, in 2017, talks of poetry as spiritual art. He writes with pen name of Sufi Benam. He has published many books uh, in poetry, such as Benam Panne, Wo Din Wapas La Sakti Ho, uh, Be Lagam, and Udan. And his poems and translations have appeared in Indian Literature Sahitya Academy's biannual journal, Kritya Poetry Journal and Lapis Lazuli. Professor Anand Khatri is the founder of Poesis Society for Poetry. And he is also the founder of Urban Village Charitable Trust, UVCT, which is a research organization which deals in urban villages, paradigms of urban growth and water in the city. And he loves to talk about poetry and innovation, poetry and spirituality, and poetry and architecture. With this, I welcome Professor Anand Khatri, and I'll request him to resume his pr uh, presentation. Thank you, Amitesh. I think there was a lot of poetry in this, you know, but there's a bit of architecture also. <laughs> I'll start my screen share. The first part of the presentation talks about what we did in the studio. And uh, in fact, after the studio ended, we continued working towards it. So the first uh, film is about that. And the second one which follows, which is a very short introduction to our effort called UVCT. So please be, be with us through the presentation. Thank you. Now, Bangale is a linear urban village. This was one of the first studies that we had taken up on urban villages. And uh, it stands as an example of commercialization, which had supported the development in its precinct. It is a series of urban villages, starting from Barola to Salarpur, with the support of Kakarala on the, on, on the northwest, and then Yakupur, Ilahabad, Sultanpur, and Shahapur. It's almost a continuous linearity wherein Bangal is the biggest. It is about five square kilometers and would be having a population of about two lakhs of people. The main road that passes through the village has existed as a potential connection to Delhi through the Okla Barrage since 1800s. 
the Okla Barrage which was constructed in 1874 for navigation through Yamuna in between Delhi and Agra has been the prime reason for the development of these series of villages. I must also mention that in late 1700s there was this battle of Marathas for which we have a memorial constructed in the golf course uh, club and uh, at sector 37. For many years till the time the expressway between Noida and Greater Noida was constructed this road which is passing through Bhangail was the main trade route it was the main road which was connecting the northern parts of Noida to the southern industrial districts and even to Greater Noida and to Dadri. So this has uh, this particular stretch which has got urban village just on both the sides had been serving all the industrial sectors the phase two the NSEZ sector 80, 82, 83 the hosiery complex and it has been the catchment area for the supply of materials and labor. The importance of this village comes from the fact that it alone had taken up a huge load of development and had developed all the or, or rather it had housed all the uses that were to support development uses for which the land of Noida was not economically viable uses like warehousing uses like building construction shops uses like places for workers to stay and henceforth it had been in continuous engagement it was working hand in hand with development and right now when all the surrounding areas are developed the view of all of us including each of us who pass through Bangil, who have to drive through Bangil, is that this is an area that needs to go off the geography of Noida. Whereas the truth is that all the sectors that surround this particular urban village are even till now being supported by what we call the energy of the core, the core in the urban villages. Of what we see Bhangil today is the face of economic reaction to the development and construction activity around. It is a village without any development authority or planners and architects to support it and yet it has been offering solutions to a planned city for engaging and meeting its economic compulsions like a third world country trying to keep pace with modernization in the first world, Pangail has been trying to adapt to the pressures of the planning lacuna worldwide as in Noida. Noida has been following the footprints of development and perceptions of planners, but it has not recognized all the typologies and all the uses and the economies of these uses which are necessary for development. The initial village which I had mentioned which grew out from a few shacks and small cottages and a huge Maharishi Mahesh Yogi ashram after the agricultural lands were purchased by Noida authority has now grown to be an important hub. The fabric around Bhangil is a homogeneous mix of development authority land comprising of the developing and the developed industrial and residential sectors and many urban villages in its proximity. It is evident that the urban villages and the developed sectors in the zone of Noida have formed a chessboard pattern and almost coexisted holding hand in hand. I have reasons to assume by the name of villages like Gadarpur and Sadarpur 
that there was an engagement of these villages during the mutiny of 1857 especially in the light of the fact that the armies and the collection of soldiers marching to Delhi from Meerut and Dadri would have followed the old trade routes created. Now this is a very dense area and all the villages that served as a labor ca catchment for the industries are all in this area. Strategies of villagers who are living in Bhangel for developing uses are very simple. They look around, they scout around the developing areas, they identify what is needed and they start supplying it. It is such a beautiful process if you look at the economic aspect of this process. It's a gap filling process. and. Not just Bhangil, but all urban villages have been providing these stopgap arrangements for development all through. But all the while that Bhangil was being an economic supplier, a labor supplier, a, a use supplier, or maybe a, while it was holding the hand of development, there were people who were living in Bhangil and they needed a safe residential life. So all along the road, the construction of buildings is very, very dense, almost forming a fortification so that the activity on the road, the trade activity on the road does not penetrate deep inside the fabric. And inside the fabric, we have open spaces. We have green spaces. In uh, behind Salarpur and Bangil, the, the road connecting Salarpur to Bangil, we even have water bodies. Noida was an area of large number of water bodies. There were huge talabs. There were huge water bodies in Bangil, which have disappeared. It's not a matter of just environmental concerns but also social concerns today the stage is that the open areas which were there inside Bhangil have also been disappearing what is the most interesting thing about Bhangil is that it is not just a area which we need to study for planning issues it's not just an area that needs to be studied for human issues but it also has got a whole lot of academic architectural inventory also. Some of the older villages in Noida, which have existed for long, have a lot of typologies which we always have studied in our architecture. One of them is gates, the other is kaldi sacks, the third is the use of courtyards, the fourth is the construction of internal open spaces, internalized open spaces, clusters, and the fifth is mohallas. So we find all these typologies and all these features existing in Bangil. The question is that without any synergic connectivity to historicity, to historic connect, how is it possible for Bhangil to come up with these solutions, these architectural vocabularies? So we don't find any evident answer to this, but all that we could draw as an inference is that the society, that the climate, that the traditions, and that the place and the economy all these five aspects contribute to the development of these vocabularies. Now, what did we do in the studio? As a part of the project, the students initially when they went to the site, they were disgusted. They did not want to work. They did with the first engagement with Bhangil, they were so disillusioned because whenever an architectural student walks into these areas, he sees these areas as, you know, areas of blight, areas of traffic congestions, areas of, you know, uh, disorganization. So there was no interest. 
but then we got them into the fabric we walked with them deep inside the villages we walked with them through the gates we walked with them in the market streets explaining them sections explaining them the areas explaining them the issue explaining them that the road width of 60 meters as compared to the street width of not even 3 meters is a ratio of less than 1 is to 10, 1 is to 20, which is a very strange ratio. So they realized that there was something that needed to be done and that is where the work began. That is where we started this whole activity and we documented the area in terms of building outlines, we studied typologies, we studied land uses, they had a hands-on experience of understanding mixed land uses and they could also see that because of commercial pressures the cul-de-sacs were almost like small fingers projecting out of the main spine and they could see it for themselves that open areas and open areas where festivals and congregations and all these things happened where schools happened were all internalized inside the fabric they could figure out that there were not enough medical educational and other facilities for the residents of Bangalore. There was a dearth of water supply and sanitation and with this their engagement with the area began so this was the point where they realized that one policy decision or one set of documents or a set of documents which could just write down that road width has to be so much or the building height has to be so much or the setback has to be so much would not be sufficient for making an intervention in Bhangil. And they all agreed that the process that we had to follow was the process of design and that is where it all started taking shape while we were making our studies we came to know that there was a proposal for the construction of an elevated road on Bhangil. now this elevated drive through in Bhangil would destroy Bhangil. so some of them worked on possibilities of densification some of them worked on the elevated road and the uses that the elevated road could be put to below it some of them worked on the substitute to the elevated road and said that instead of building an elevated road we should have a road which is running as subterranean to the elevated road and a ground connect between the village could be established some of them tried to densify the fabric by implanting walkways deep inside the fabric which would work at an elevated level and also reinforce the buildings wherever they are and all these examples there were students who were regimenting hawkers finding solutions to how the shops would open and spread out because the shop depth at a lot of places is very little and some of them were working on notes some of them picked up the cue from the architectural vocabulary and said that in case if we could have regular facades in case if we could have facades which were uh, synergic in nature it would appear as a better area because if you look at this these videos which I had shown then they say that there is some amount of synergy that exists in the way of construction so at the end of the studio we all realized that design was the way to handle the area piece by piece and it was only after a complete outlook is developed in design that guidelines for smaller areas can be developed can be written down and then the whole area can be worked on so the strategy for doing these areas is different it is piece by piece it is design issue by issue it is not a regulatory mechanism it is not a regulation that can be used to develop it the tool is design and henceforth the studio concluded in a very successful uh, endeavor as a uh, as a part of the faculty I was very satisfied and I'm really thankful to 
my co-faculties, Professor Gautam Mitra and Poonam Jha, who were there with me at that point of time, and all the students of the batch of 2013. Now I have a few students talking about their studies and then we will take this further. Hello everyone, I am Shubham Tandon. During our fourth year urban design studio, in an attempt to understand urban villages with the guidance of our studio professor architect Anand Khatris, we listed down the problems and challenges of Bangale based on our site survey and one-on-one -on -one interactions with the people of Bangale. On discussing the collected data with the class and professors, we drafted the issues of Bangale on six different drawings, making sure that we don't miss out on anything. Since now we had all the issues drafted, it was time for us to pick up issues that can be solved through our design interventions. After a few sessions of brainstorming with our studio professor, architect Anand Khatris, I came down to the conclusion that the major issues that I will be addressing will be social nodes, parking provision in the area, connectivity of the entire stretch. And due to these issues, the people of Bangale were facing many problems, including lack of pedestrian and vehicular movement, lack of recreational spaces, encroachments by shop owners on the footpath, due to which pedestrians were forced to walk on roads, disturbing the entire vehicular movement. My objective was to design solutions for civic structures in urban scape as seen for the design of foot over bridges. Taking inspiration from the Mumbai Skywalk project, the aim was to show the role of civic structures in urban scape. Introduction of Skywalk was my design intervention. The Skywalk is designed in such a way that it gives Bangale a new identity. The addition of Skywalk helps in dealing with pedestrian congestion on the road level, hence giving proper road width to the vehicular traffic for smooth movement. In future, if metro line ever comes to Bangale, this skywalk can be connected with it and hence divert the pedestrian traffic movement, avoiding congestion of auto rickshaws and e rickshaws on the roads, which disturb the vehicular traffic as we see it at various other metro stations. The skywalk also caters to the hawkers by providing separate spaces for them on the skywalk. Since Bangale lacks public spaces like parks and jogging tracks, the skywalk caters to this problem as well and also provides multiple views along the entire stretch. As the pedestrian movements get diverted on the skywalk, we get ample amount of parking space on the road level. Multiple entry and exit points were also created at specific distances allowing pedestrians to commute between different levels. Ramps and escalators were also provided for physically challenged and barrier-free movement. Hi, I am Akshay Aroda. In our urban design problem, we had this size of this district which is Bangale. While doing the site studies and learning about the ongoing problems faced by people of Bangale and an urban network as a whole, we as a team of teachers and students listed the problems by doing one-to-one -one interactions with the locals. Out of them all, I found out with every solution in the design, there is a negative spaces which are left unused in developing countries like India, where there is a lack of usable and breathable spaces. After learning about transportation and networking issues while having several sessions with our professor Anand Khatri, I came up to a con conclusion to propose an elevated corridor along with the treatment of negative spaces under it. Taking the inspirational case studies of JJ Flyover Mumbai, and MRR to at Janan Kanan Kuala Lumpur. Since the road network of Bangale is being used as a crossway from Delhi to Noida, which is the main cause of traffic congestion and pollution in Bangale. My objective was to identify and study existing usage patterns of spaces under flyover following the proposal of the meaningful and imaginative uses for this negative spaces. The main challenges were no organize, organized open areas and common areas, lack of landscape and green areas, overcrowded and unorganized dead spaces, no socio-cultural spaces, streets do not allow people to be interactive, lack of parking areas along the streets. Solutions with my proposals were as follows. Elevated corridor play a major role in streamlining the traffic control system. 
plenty of time is saved by avoiding congestion pollution effect is reduced flyover reduce the risk of accidents parking spaces can be catered under the flyover spaces allocated for sulab toilet complex to avoid open defecation all the approaches are through elevators or ramps to make it friendly for differently abled people spaces for evening markets or sunday markets to avoid the haphazard movement on roads caused by hawkers garden areas and kiosks for cultural and co-curricular activities for kids and learners well it was a great experience and learning through this exercise hi myself nabiha the area of intervention on which i was focusing in mangel was preparation of guidelines for elevation control on the existing facades and for new construction in future first of all i did site study developing street sections and analyzing them looking at the commercial spine of urban village bangel i observed that bangel is growing along with its surrounding areas like noida but its buildings are losing the architectural character our urban environment cannot afford to have a low quality built fabric there is a need of some guidelines which are meant as an aid to encourage creativity innovation and suggest alternative solutions emphasis will be on aesthetic and relationship with the contextual environment that is very important so i was doing this particular exercise under my under the guidance of my professor mr anand khatri he guided me to form an approach methodology in which first we did elevation study doing architectural documentation of street facade and then forming samples of different typologies studying architectural vocabulary then standardizing standards and case studies i did two case study one in hazrat ganj market lucknow and the other nehru bazar in jaipur in both the cases we the inferences was almost same there was a clearance of uh, encroachments giving a uniform color to the facade and standardization of signages and hoardings so for the proposal and implementation we made an analysis chart to reach some inferences and enhancement in proposals so we form the typologies a b c d e and f so a was the, the buildings consisting of shops in ground floor and residences in the upper floors b was the buildings commercial uh, with some f- ornamentation and facades and c commercial building with contemporary facades d was residential buildings with shops in front and a stairwell attached to it acting as a vertical element e was commercial complexes with mezzanine floors and f buildings with the wide frontage consisting of various shops in a row and residential use in upper floors so from these learnings i got to know that due to smaller plot size the building frontage is less which contribute to interesting skyline of bangal because buildings in bangal cannot be abnormally high since the width of the building is low it will always project a low building height that should follow a relationship between new and existing building transition design solution it was an urban fabric characterized by dead facade blank walls and exposed surfaces that scars one townscape streetscape and skylines so there is a need of some guidelines so by inferring all the by analyzing all the typologies we infer that all the commercial buildings should have elevation design inclusive of fascias of shop front and building having character influenced by some traditional style should follow symmetry and correct ratio percentage of fenestration should be adequate the design of commercial and residential facade should be complementing each other and basic minute ornamentation which is not contributing to any vocabulary should have an appealing architectural character to so making changes in the typologies we found some compatible combination of proposed elevation for bhangal 
there is a need to design the informal hawker experience in any of these areas which are there in our cities so a uh, effort was made by a couple of students to design hawkers and vendor shops along the roadside in my fourth year we had to choose an individual topic after the group study of urban village bhangel my topic was nodes and junctions the nodes are the main constituent according to which a city is recognized and understood my aim was to identify and understanding the urban character and detail of nodes for further enhancement and its development now the types of nodes i have divided it into five categories first is geometric according to the shape for example india gate roundabout second the built volume a space with the built mass around the node for example node junction at second main road and seventh cross road in bangalore third landmark the node is identified with the landmark for example fountain chowk in chandni chowk fourth character it provides a strong character for example pari chowk fifth non built it lacks the character and includes the intersection for example atta market first is the commercial node this was chosen as it consists of the two important and main roads of bhangel dadri and gheja road which carry the main vehicular flow of the town this node has the complete potential to give bhangel an identity and a strong character issues lack of common open spaces lack of proper street furniture and trees overcrowding of sewerage and drainage system no dhalao and garbage dump area lack of public toilets encroachment and inadequate space of parking no bus stop the transformer obstruct the view of market and are not covered which is quite dangerous movement pattern there was a traffic congestion due to unorganized space and surface parking street curbs dividers crossings and mediums are also missing building heights and age 3 to 4 story high building no particular identity and landmark 10 to 15 years old buildings with bad condition and unappealing facades activities around main market along the main roads the area is commercial with mixed land use i wish to use this opportunity to put up a few questions at the end of this presentation what if there is a huge earthquake what if there is a huge fire there is no provision in any of the urban villages that are there either in noida or in delhi for meeting these emergencies and imagine the present situation of covid the situation is grave there is no mention in any of the draft master plans or any of the master plans beat any metro city in our country as to how they would develop aid to develop or support the development of the areas which are the so called areas of urban villages i am not saying that we reached at a solution but each student and each participant in this activity walked back with a consciousness people who used to think that just because their cars could not speed at 80 kmph on the road of bhangel and that is why bhangel should be destroyed people who were always thinking that because of the traffic congestion the road had should be widened and the shops should be pushed further back and hence forth the fabric should be destroyed people who saw the congestion in branding the congestion in the areas and felt that this all should go off from the face of noida they all realized that inside this fabric was life inside the huge walls of the over constructions people were living and it is these people who are continuously aiding us in our lives our workers our drivers maids household helps emergency workers small time construction workers sweepers cleaners everybody and even those like any of us who are making a fresh start in a city they come and live in the safe economies of these villages 
so we must raise our consciousness we must open our minds to the need of the society to the need of our brothers to the need of our countrymen to the need of the shallows of our towns which have become cesspools of mistakes which have been supporting our development thank you UVCT is a handshake a handshake between academia and the efforts that architects and planners need to put into their cities it is a research platform where academic institutions through their students participate in the areas around them understanding organic architecture and human settlements the use of urban design as a method for appreciation and hence for identifying solutions for urban villages slums villages and abadi areas appreciation of living history in architecture and utilizing the academic exuberance and hard work of students to aid local governance academic studios with a conclusion and finally to understand where we are with reference to our vernacular and our indian architecture the members of ubct comprise of an exuberant group which proposes to use the academic energies towards the direction of these studies UVCT was formed by the instruction of Dr S M Akhtar of Jamia Millia Islamia it enjoys the support of professor Rajat Ray from Delhi and Dr Anurag Verma from Jaipur Dr Binu Tom from Kochi and international scholars like Dr Manish Chalana have been exuberantly participating in its activities we have the support of local architect groups and professionals like architect ragendra bisain and scholars of history like dr vishaka kavakathekar dr vishali prasad blatkar and dr tarush chandra we also have in our think tank dr nisar khan from jamia dr gauri kotnis shurukar professor deve gupta and dr manju basoya pundhir from uae dr sonal mittal who is a heritage landscape specialist and myself the so called development the wide roads the cities that we see in our country have all grown out of a seed the seed which we see unattended to the seed which is evidently not cared for it is not just a seed which has grown and which is of no value it is not a the kernel it is a live seed it is a live core it is a live energy our rural areas our villages our urban villages our slums this is where we need to focus if you look at the umbrellas of planning they comprise of all possibilities that relate to are in synchronization with or are agreeable to the values of management of development now the management of development happens through planning it happens through a little bit of conservation modernization you know town planning extension of urban sprawls but all this is not the face of development what is left behind to be attended to must be looked into we all know that while we are walking out of history we have left these chunks of spaces we have left these chunks of areas which still are the most traditional in terms of indian architecture which have 
features like gates, cul-de-sacs, courtyards, mahallas, introverted open spaces, angans, kunj, chabutras, dalans, bazaars, jharokhas, chocks, chawls, ahatas, katras, wadas, etc. As a part of the historic continuum and as constructions which find it economically viable to construct these typologies as combinations of economic, cultural, social and climatic patterns that these areas need to be looked into. Every profession must look beyond itself. Every profession must realize its own responsibility beyond the drafting board, beyond the design, beyond the construction, the values for which architects must live comprise of technological innovations, activism, academic repository development, journalism, to extend the outreach for the practice of architecture, to extend the area of practice. If it is not for architects, who would look into these areas? Who would look into these issues and highlight them as tangible formats for planners, for government bodies, for agencies that can bring about a change? It is us. So we must take this up as activism and as our responsibility. Now, Abadi is a handshake. It's a format through which UVCT engages with academic institutions to develop training programs, dialogues, lectures, conscious attempts to develop design studios with a conclusion, to put up competitions, conferences, publications and vertical studios as a result of which we believe that we would have individuals who are architects with better consciousness and more geared up to understand the situations in these areas and henceforth attend to when they reach their practice while we submit all the studies that are done through the handshake to government bodies. Abadi 1 is focusing on Noida with DTC. Abadi 2 is focusing on Delhi. Abadi 3 on Greater Noida, Jaipur, Bhopal, Kochi, Chandigarh and many more areas. We are on the job. We are also extremely thankful to DTC for this first engagement. This workshop is divided into a workshop on a linear urban village of Bangal. After this, we would study Hoshiarpur and Gijor, the twin urban villages, the Nayabas and Raipur Khadar as a case of contrast where extreme urban choking has left no possibilities of, for development, Atta and Indra market, which are urban village markets which form the core of the city of Noida, through which all other commercial districts have been born. And then the last is the dialogue on water in the city, where we, we would discuss how the Shadra Canal, the Yamuna and the Hindon the three water bodies that pass through uh, the city of Noida are not at all in engagement with the urban development. This is a part of our recommendation for the master plan 2051. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anand, for this very, very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, gives a lot of thought for uh, uh, thought, rather, and uh, not only on Bangal, but also about how what is the role of architects and architecture in urban development. So, without uh, much, uh, uh, because I think we're running out of time. Amitesh, we should uh, invite the um, yes. next speaker immediately. Uh, you can keep his uh, maybe introduction a little bit uh, short. Uh, 
Sorry, Manish, yes. but I, I'm told you are very well known and already uh, quite famous. So, uh, Amitesh. Uh, now, uh, now uh, I'll request uh, our second speaker, Dr. Manish Shalana. Uh, his short bio, as short as I, it can be. Uh, he is a graduate degree holder in architecture from Mangalore University. Uh, he also possesses master's degree in um, uh, MR from School of Architecture, New Delhi, and landscape architecture from Penn State. And he has got PhD in urban planning from University of Colorado. Before teaching at University of Washington, he also taught at University of Colorado and Pennsylvania State, State University. In India, he has also worked in organizations such as INTAC and HADCO. He is one of the two founding directors of the Center for Preservation and Adaptive Use, uh, Adaptive Reuse, sorry, CPAR, which strives to connect academia to practice mm -hmm. of historic preservation. So he has also published numerous articles and papers uh, in various reputed journals, uh, such as uh, Future Interior, Journal of Architectural Education, Journal of American Planning Association, Journal of Planning History and Planning Perspectives. Now I welcome Dr. Manish Chalana uh, for his uh, presentation. Th thank you. Uh, and I'm happy to happy to be here. Uh, uh, Deva, I'm, I'm not going to uh, take a lot of time. I, uh, I'm going to briefly give you an overview of uh, of urban villages uh, in the international context, but also engaging India. So I'll just get started since we're running behind schedule. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and let's see how I do that. Uh, uh, so on the bottom you have screen share button in green. Okay, I, I have that, but then I, I don't know how to keep my... Uh, so just click okay. on the screen share, you will see your computer. Yeah. yeah, do you see that? Yes, yes, yes. So this is my screen, right? Uh, okay, okay. You, everyone, everyone sees my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, very quickly, I wanted to start with my introduction. Uh, I'm not going to go over this, but if any of you, and this is looking at the students, uh, if you want to uh, 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 want to know more about the kind of work I do and where I'm based, and uh, please feel free to look up my my university webpage, and there you can find information about me. And uh, if you need to get in touch with me, uh, my email is also somewhere here, or you can. Uh, get that email from your from your college. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to jump right into the topic of uh, urban villages. Uh, as a caveat, I'm I'm not an expert on urban villages per se, but I I am an urban planner and a conservationist, and uh, use multiple lenses in planning and preservation that might lend themselves to urban village context as well. And then, and based on that, I'm going to share some of those with you. Uh, uh, particularly the students, to uh, for them to get a better understanding of the multiple ways in which these uh, these neighborhoods can be understood in in the planning context. So uh, my talk is uh, divided up into four pieces. Very quickly, I'm going to go over the background, history, and theory of urban villages, how this concept came into being. And, and dwell a little bit on Asian context, particularly in, in China and some in India, uh, and, and then uh, wrap up with the North American context, particularly in Seattle, and, and then try to distill some lessons for practice. Uh, hopefully I can do this in, in under 20 minutes. Uh, so, so I wanna start with uh, the, just the term itself. Uh, I wanna problematize the term of uh, urban village, as you can all uh, notice that there's an in inherent tension and dichotomy in the phrasing of urban villages, right? It is both urban uh, and non-urban and rural, right? And at the same time, it's neither urban nor, nor urban nor, nor rural. You know, it's within a city, you know, but it's outside, also outside of the city, not spatially, but, you know, culturally and in other ways. So, so it's a very uh, uh, complex beast to get a full handle on. And that is why 
uh, urban planning continues to struggle with it because you cannot put it in a nice, neat, sanitized category, right? So it defies, in some sense, it defies categorizations and any attempt at cat categorizations have, have not entirely been successful. Uh, so what, what is the name? Uh, Patrick Giris, the Scottish planner who you're probably all familiar with, gave us the, he, he's credited to have coined the term urban village, you know, and you, he uses it in, in, in passing to describe his work during his work in India from 1915 to 1919, right? Uh, and, and very quickly he, he developed the approach that some of you may know already, conservative surgery uh, as a minimal and strategic intervention to accommodate non-Western patterns of urban form and development. So, you know, so he, he's one of the few or perhaps the only colonial planner who, uh, who reconceptualizes the relationship between rural and urban in the urban setting of India. And keep in mind by this point, this opportunity of reconceptualizing urban and rural in the urban setting pretty much only remained in India because it, the Western world had already been industrialized and rural was far more disconnected than urban and they were not overlapping in the way they were overlapping in, in India. So Patrick Giddies saw this as a concept and you know he, he brings in this trash, transnational idea of uh, urban village from West and, and then tries to you know, uh, educate some of the planners in India who of course did not listen to him and uh, particularly Latin in his planning of Delhi, he got rid of all the villages uh, and as uh, most of the villages as, as Deve was noticing. Uh, as they had, had mentioned. So Latian and Giris had, you know, uh, uh, they didn't quite appreciate each other's work. So, and there's evidence evidence to that. So so just, just for you to dwell on this complexity, this concept of an urban village presents. So it's not that easy to get on the drafting board and start planning for it. Uh, next slide, uh, let's see. Uh, so again, there are numerous ways in which you can understand urban villages, right? And I've taken the liberty of uh, using the Ian McCarg uh, layering to understand, you know, what might be the different layers, lenses through which you could understand urban village. One of course is the morphology, which I heard many students talk about. So it's largely in this realm that the studio dwelled on, you know, morphology is focuses mostly on the built form, street patterns, land uses and such, you know. And interesting elements of urban morphology for urban villages is also the interface between formal and informal, modern and traditional or modern or non-modern. So there's a lot of that going on as well. Another layer to think about is sociology, which is, you know, how do people inhabit these villages? Where do they come from? What are the memory that they bring with them? And how do they shape these places? How do they inhabit these places? What are the social and kinship networks there? So there's a whole sociology piece, which of course intersects with the morphology piece. So these are not discrete pieces. They all bleed into each other, as you can see. Then of course, the third piece is socio uh, economics, uh, which is, you know, livelihoods, as you know, in Chirag, uh, in, in Delhi, uh, the urban village of Chirag, that's the industry for dumplings, momos. All the momos in, in, in Delhi, I believe are made in Chirag and different industrial industries are located in different urban villages. So there's a livelihood component in urban villages, which ties in with small scale industries, but sometimes also uh, larger than small scale industries. So that's another lens that you can study urban villages with. Uh, the fourth is equity, because it, it is, these are neighborhoods that offer affordable housing to a vast urban poor population in, in, in the cities, right? In that regard, they're equitable. But then again, they're not fully equitable because these are also places of oppression where landlords, you know, exploit the urban poor. So there's a lot of complexity in that lens as well. Uh, there's this lens of history and memory uh, that you could think about because most of these villages are typically older. They were there before the city, right? You know, in, in for instance, in Delhi, Nizamuddin and others, Chirag, Kirki and others, they were much more much they're much more older than New Delhi itself. Uh, so with that comes uh, historicity, that comes heritage, it comes the, there is memory. So these can also inform our understanding of urban villages. And lastly, uh, health and well-being. You know, uh, you can study these areas 
through the lens of disease, hygiene, welfare, crime, and such. And a lot of scholars are looking at it. Uh, so this is this, just for the students as you develop this uh, projects of urban uh, villages, uh, try not to just focus on morphology, certainly dwell into the sociology, you know, and also take into consideration well-being and health as well as equity because this, and, and economics, because this is what these lenses are going to make your study uh, interesting. Uh, very quickly, the concept of urban villages, you know, uh, uh, come from uh, what we call, I don't think if I don't know if I can write on this, but it's an e ecological concept of uh, natural areas, right, uh, which, which has urban planning implications. So this is how scholars who study neighborhoods say, you know, traditional neighborhoods have been understood as uh, natural areas, uh, which means, you know, uh, they are understood as unplanned uh, organic settlements, which have which are distinct cultural areas uh, with their own complex institutions, customs, beliefs, traditions, and such. And there's a lot of theory of natural areas. And as I was reviewing those for this presentation, it seems like the ideas of natural areas fully lend themselves for uh, fully lend themselves to uh, urban villages. You know, because they they if you look at that theory, it lines up nicely with what urban villages are, particularly in the, in the Indian context. Uh, and historically, you know, uh, there were a patchwork of such natural areas scattered around in the landscape. And then large urbanization happens. So think about New Delhi or Chandigarh, right? There's this land with multiple patchworks of these natural areas where different caste groups reside in different areas, you know? And then the, the modern city happens and ultimately they end up uh, finding themselves as part of the uh, uh, modern cities, but yet, yet they continue to, if they are retained, they continue to, uh, you know, uh, retain some of these networks and these understandings of spaces and these networks and institutions and such. So there's more literature in the national areas if, if any of you are interested. Uh, moving on, uh, you know, and as I said, natural areas are formed based on racial, ethnic, uh, lines in the Indian context, they are formed based on caste groupings, different castes, juts are in one village, you know, the upper castes are in, in a different village. So that can happen. In the US context, you, what you're seeing here, here is New York East Side in the, in the 19th century. So many of the immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe, uh, as well as Southern Europe, the Jews from the Eastern Europe and Italians uh, uh, and Greeks from Southern Europe, they settled in different neighborhoods in the city. and those were called the natural areas, right? So multiple neighborhoods developed with those characteristics. You know, there's a lot of garlic used in Italian uh, villages. So that was called the garlic gulch. Uh, there was this uh, counterculture village that evolved, which is called the Greenwich village where the hippies and the non-conforming uh, people live. Uh, there was an affluent area, of course, uh, of the Beverly Hills where the rich resided. So multiple areas emerge in the city uh, and uh, so this is one way of, of looking at it. In the Indian context, you know, Bollywood has picked up on informality of urban villages or informal settlements. You know, in many movies you may have seen from Sri Char Sobis to Jaak Tirho, you know, uh, you see urbanization and modernization uh, is being held responsible for breaking down social patterns and denting morality of informal settlements or urban villages, whatever you want to call it, right? So here's a quick story of, uh, if, for those of you, especially students who don't know, this is from Sri Charsobis. Raju is a village bumpkin. He works in a laundry. You know, he's very simple. He has utopian simplicity uh, in Mumbai, but he's corrupted by the city, of course, right? And he meets this woman, Maya, who's a high society woman and who, who thrives on uh, parties and gambling and such, right? So she lures him into this fancy world and transforms him, to, him into Rajkumar or the prince of a people nigger, uh, and he gains a lot of wealth. So one night, you know, as Maya is performing a, a cabaret, uh, everything, the reality hits Raju. And uh, you see him, and I can't play the clip, you should look it up yourself. You see him leaving the formal city and he's just leaving, he's holding his head and he's moving into his urban village, right? He's leaving the horrors of the city behind and he's coming home to the urban village to find his true self. And then there's a there's a dance number called Ramaya Vastavaya, you know, where which is it's a village-like wholesome setting where people have different value system, they have different uh, morals and different mores. So 
even in the wordings of the song you know he she says teri aankhon mein ye duniyadari na thi which means the city has corrupted you right tu aur tha tera dil aur tha meaning you 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 know your value system has changed uh, because you 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 are now more part of the city right so this this is sort of the perception of neighborhood that leads to the idea of the decline of the community theory uh, and i know i'm running out of time but the decline of the community theory is once these villages uh, find themselves in the urban context uh, they get uh, uh, they get corrupted by modernization they kept get corrupted by urbanization which ramaya vastavya very na- very nicely uh, portrays right uh, so uh, so and this is planners see this decline of the community as you know tying to division of labor uh, increasing density heterog- heterogeneous communities and of course urbanization and modernization you know all urbanization and modernization lead to weakening of uh, uh, individual and communal ties uh, and there's greater mobility so people can move around so the concept of neighborhood then begins to crack and that is the idea of the decline of the community and this is what is happening with urban villages It, for for several decades uh in in an urban context they try to retain their uh traditional urban form uh traditional patterns and belief systems and uh, for 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 the most part you know uh some much like the village that you see in the song of ramaya vastavya even though it's overly glamorized and uh, ideal uh, setting uh, but you know more recently in the last 30 40 50 years uh the this corruption if you will Uh, has seen weakening the bonds uh, in uh, in urban villages but not just not just social bonds but also the transformation of urban form you know it's looking more modern it's hyper density uh, and you've seen the urban villages in in delhi uh, uh, that testify to that so the, what do the modernists do they want to create an um, a sort of a urban village themselves which they give the idea of the neighborhood unit right so modernists want to create wholesome villages uh wholesome neighborhoods that would benefit different strata of society so clarence parry gives us the idea of the neighborhood unit which you see here it's an inward focused uh uh unit which you know has has boundaries that the students and anand was talking about uh it has circulation uh and you know it is more inward inward focused and it has amenities like churches and uh schools and open spaces and and such so le corbusier uses the same idea as super blocks and sectors that is also the idea of of neighborhood you know uh, to create neighborly spaces that promote you know community walkability and such uh and and think about it these are pretty much what the urban villages already did you know they were the scale of the neighborhood concept ties in very much with the with the urban village you know uh because urban villages are not very large so are the neighborhood blocks they're not very large they are bounded by arterials they you know they abandon the grid there's no grid uh they have neighborhood amenities they have kinship networks so pretty much you can see how the traditional ways of thinking uh tie in with the modernist ways of thinking and modernism is not that unique or that uh out, out of the ordinary as we as we may think of it uh uh moving along uh Uh, uh i want to sh- show you very quickly so what does you know on on the one hand le corbusier again you know like all modernists uh, romanticizes the ruralness you know he likes the rural he, he admires the rural around the Ch- around chandigarh if you read his uh, text that he writes he's really intrigued by the indian ruralness but what does he do he he gets rid of all the villages that you see in this map here right he gets rid of all the villages including kalibar bhangi majra and so many about 20 villages and and to to be able to test his own village his, his own neighborhood concept which is the uh, with a sector right he does that uh and his decision to obliterate the villages can be critiqued from the from today's post colonial vantage which i will do which i have already done in my uh, piece on chandigarh that i've written on in in planning history so like i said on one hand le corbusier uh, clearly fetishizes rural india its primitiveness you know furthering his paternalistic agenda uh, to u- to using modernism to civilize a non western world right so he brings in modernism to teach us indians how to live uh 
so he described, you know, he's very, uh, he's very fascinated by these women workers who work uh, on the site. As you can see, this is the, the capital site. He describes the site of teams of women dressed in the wildest color, carrying in baskets on their heads, uh, the earth of the foundations, which he likens to a hallucination, right? And his photographer, uh, Scheidegger, who comes and joins him, took this picture that I've used in the article, you know. Uh, so he has many pictures of the primitive village, uh, including this one of a peasant woman carrying a basket of building materials, balancing it on a makeshift uh, ramp, you know, in front of the secretariat building. So it's a great juxtaposition of modern in the back and rural in, in, in the front, right? Uh, but he doesn't keep any of the villages. Uh, some of the villages in Chandigarh are actually uh, retained in the second phase of the city's development. Uh, and that was also due to uh, a very large grassroots activism that happens, which was called Pind, Pind Bachao in Punjabi, right? Which was a committee was set up in 1969. It leads to massive protests against land acquisition and demanded the villagers demand their right to not be displaced. They wanted to re retain in the city. Uh, along with their places of worship, their homes and their fields. Of course, they didn't get to f keep their fields. Uh, and all in all, because they didn't want their community to be disrupted. And so the, the state at that point was confronted with the choices of pursuing this, you know, modernization project, uh, but at the same time retaining some of these urban, which ultimately become urban villages in the second phase of the city's development. What you see here is Burev from an old historic map, which is very small here, as you can see. And this is how it looks today in the Google Earth image, right? Uh, it's, and this is very fascinating because, you know, Burel is, it's like smack in the middle of the grid city. So in that sense, in, in just in its layout, it is defying, it's resisting uh, the gridification, right? It's saying, no, I can be my, uh, we can be what we have to be, even though we are surrounded or suffocated by a modernist grid, we can we can remain right. So within Borel, as you can see, it's it's non-gridded. Uh, it retains you know a mix of non-modern planning tradition and mixed urban form. It has mixed uses. It is it has huge density. It is packed. Uh, it provides housing for low-income populations. And overall, I think it it resists uh, uh, modernization to some degree. And and one could argue that it also embraces modernization in its current context. Uh, moving on to China, uh, the conditions of urban villages in China are, are quite similar to that in, in India. Uh, they're commonly inhabited by urban poor in China, uh, as well as transients. Uh, they're often associated with squalor, uh, overcrowding, disease, and filth, and as seen as social problems, as some of the Indian urban villages are as well. And they continue to provide affordable housing and economic opportunities for peasants and low income city residents in China as well. So there's that parallel in China. Uh, uh, and as in India, you know, landlords in these urban villages are building multi multi story properties uh, within their Laldora, you know, which is a village collective. They call it a village collective and they rent it out to the city's floating populations, you know, who are only able to afford that an apartment in the, within uh, the urban villages there, you know. Uh, as in India, the urban villages in China are also not regulated by uh, the planning uh, authority, by centralized planning, they have centralized planning, but urban villages are beyond the purview. Uh, as a result, most of them are heavily populated, intensely developed and lack infrastructure. All this is probably sounding familiar to you because that's really how urban villages are in India as well, you know. Uh, and some some are really really dense. Uh, what you see here on the screen is the urban villages called hutongs in Beijing, right? These are largely alley homes, uh, courtyard dwellings arranged along the alley uh, to form you know hutongs, and these are very large, high density, low lying uh, neighborhoods, you know. Uh, and since the late 1990s, China has been eyeing these villages and this started with the planning of the olympics in beijing because if you if you've been to beijing uh, the forbidden city which is the the most visited uh, area in all of china is surrounded by these uh, urban villages and china of course did not want uh, its its image of modernity and uh, you know 
a global modernity be distracted by these villages. So at that time, China did a lot of uh, demolition and acquiring these villages. Of course, India can't do planning in the way China can with top-down planning. They were, of course, compensated, but moved way far out. And there was a lot of resistance, but resistance failed you know, for the most part. So since the late 2000s, the Beijing government has done forced redevelopments of urban villages, especially in the prime and strategically located areas like the one that you see in, in, in the neighborhood, because they want to unlock the high property values, right? Uh, and that give, unlocking high property values enable municipal governments to raise more taxes. Uh, and, and they were able to offer better compensation to, to the people, uh, but then uh, clean the land and, and make it available to new multi-million property classes of people who began to inhabit these areas. Numerous ways these urban villages are tackled in China, uh, and I can talk more later in another uh, talk, but I'll give you a couple of examples. One is a famous example of your Hutong, uh, which was uh, uh, a courtyard housing project in 1993, uh, and it, it, used the approach of urban renewal. So it didn't fully go and demolish uh, the uh, dilapidated uh, hutongs. It actually re restored some and reconstructed some uh, in the same pattern, as you can see, right? So the traditional courtyard houses were re uh, restored, they were improved, uh, and wholesale demolition was avoided. So as a result of that, it, it was recognized internationally and it won a Habitat, World Habitat Award also. So students, if you're interested in it, you can find more information on where uh, hutongs. Uh, but this is one of the better examples. In China, most of the hutongs are being redeveloped uh, for tourism, right? So, so many of them, as I said, have been erased. Uh, this model that you see in here, uh, hutong is not repeated. You don't see it uh, in other parts of China. Uh, there are very few developments that follow this model. Now there are basically only two types of model. Now these are erased and in its place are high rise towers, like you see in Mumbai, uh, the mill compounds, you know, in Girigao, that, that kind of development is happening. Uh, and, and the other is, you know, uh, erasing the historic form and reconstructing it new as a form of conservation because they don't want to invest so much on restoration. So they just tear it down and reconstruct it with all the modern amenities, but they look more like a traditional urban form but they're not old. So, so that is that. And there are several other ways that China is dealing with it that I don't have time to deal with. Uh, wrapping up with the case of North America. Uh, now, as Divya was mentioning, the urban villages in, in the West, uh, they look very different from what the urban villages in, in Asia, right? They're, they're just, uh, you could say that they, they were they were established and evolved during the non-automobile or pre-planning eras. You know, planning in the US gets formalized in the early 1900s. So you can think about cities that were there uh, before 1900s. That planning was very piecemeal. They were natural areas that I talked about. They were multiple, you know, pattern and patchwork of natural areas, which were sort of, you know, urban village-like uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and then planning happens and it sort of, you know, uh, tries to, uh, bring the entire fabric together and then land use happens and zoning happens and so on and so forth. But, but as it happens, many of these older city neighborhoods are retained as urban villages. So I'll give you the case of Seattle. You know, before planning was formalized in Seattle, they were at least 11 or 14 villages. Uh, so they are now uh, part of the urban fabric as urban villages. So they are called urban villages in the master plan, you know. Uh, which in layman term, you know, uh, means that, you know, there's an urban, urban, urban village element in the master plan, which is, which is, which means that urban villages are addressed at the master plan level. So at the master plan level, there are three categories, one, actually four, one is strategies. So first, actually first is categor categories. So you categorize different types of urban villages, residential, multi-use, financial, and all such. Uh, then you study their distribution. Uh, you see here on a map, uh, and then you do a mapping, you understand what the amenities are, what the resources are, what the properties are, and so on and so forth. And then you develop strategies for the urban villages. Uh, each urban village would have a different set of strategies because these are very unique. And one strategy 
would not uh, would not work for all all the urban villages. So uh, so essentially, in the master plan, these urban villages are recognized as community resources, not a problem, right? Uh, they are not seen as a problem, but they are seen as a resource. You know, they enable cities. Uh, to deliver services more equitably and to be able to pursue development patterns that are environmentally and economically sound. So to, to put it simply, uh, cities in the US are trying to bring in additional density to the city core because you know suburbs are slowing down and the millennial population wants to live in the city. The cities are growing for the first time uh, in the last 20 years since 100 years. Uh, so there's a lot. So these urban villages allow for that type of growth uh, to be accommodated in the city. So this, there's a lesson here because, you know, our urban villages can also allow for growth if managed properly. Uh, so these have become the areas of receiving additional densities. Uh, they provide opportunities for managing growth and change through collaboration with community. Uh, right. So uh, and, and the urban village strategy is largely a comprehensive approach to planning for sustainable futures. So sustainability is a big idea uh, in, in visioning of urban villages. Equity is a big piece in visioning of urban villages uh, in the urban village strategies, right? Uh, so for students in the audience, if you wanna look at how Seattle is doing it, uh, their entire urban village plan is available online. And if you can't find it, I can, I can link you to that. And you can see various ways in which the city is, is, is uh, addressing urban villages. And it's very different from the Asian context, as you know. Uh, so last slide, I just want to, and this is something that I haven't fully developed. Uh, I want to think, what are the lessons for practice for us? Uh, one, I think, is for us to collectively decolonize planning thinking and practice, right? Because we, we're so colonized, you know, like the British left, but they left babus like us behind, right? So we're called, you know, we're kind of coconut, brown from the outside, but white inside. Because, you know, we've been shaped by them. We've been taught by them. Our planning ideas, our thinking are from them. So this is the decolonization of the mind has to occur here, right? And so, and then we have to appreciate non-Western ways of thinking for design and planning paradigm, right? Why is just a grid the most effective way uh, to solve urban problems? You know, there are multiple ways you can shape the city. There are multiple ways non-Western design and planning has been successful. And one can argue that it suits better for the Indian context in many ways, for its climate, for its society, and for multi multiple other ways of socializing and such, right? Uh, so that is how, that is the fundamental shift that we have to do uh, to begin to uh, appreciate urban villages uh, and, and to see how Seattle is doing it as a community resource, as areas for, you know, uh, planning for sustainable futures and not necessarily as problems, you know, and even with the studios, not going in into urban villages to solve a problem. You know, oftentimes you don't have to solve a problem. Oftentimes, you know, uh, less is more. You don't have to do very much. Look at Patrick Giddies. He would have gone into the urban village and done very little. He would have, you know, just moved, uh, created, a, shifted a wall here or opened up a pond here and things like that. So I agree times were different. The pressures were different, but but think about it as, as you know, the non-Western ways of doing things. Uh, and, and then finally, you know, integrating, uh, coming up with a more integrated planning framework, which, uh, which addresses urban villages at the master plan level. So that, you know, and Delhi started doing that. It has notified many urban villages as urbanized and there's a whole uh, volley of problems that come with that. But, 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 but in some ways, you know, managing is not about control. It's also about flexibility. You need the uh, Laldoras to be flexible because you need to appreciate the heterogene heterogeneity that these villages present, right? Otherwise, if you, if you go into these villages with your Western tools and apparatus, you will just make them into like any other sector in Noida. And what's the point? They're not going to, you know, remain urban villages. They're going to be small sectors uh, with grids and other things. So think about that. And this is again for the students. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. There are multiple more lessons for planning, but I haven't been able to flush them out fully. And I think I may have exceeded my time. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.
Thank you, Manish. It was very interesting. I mean, don't worry so much about the time. Uh, I hope uh, people would have enjoyed it. And I think it's okay for us to extend a little bit. So I think uh, maybe now we can start with some uh, interactions, so maybe some um, reactions or uh, we questions. We can take questions here. Yeah. Comments yeah. that yeah. people, uh, uh, people want to raise. Maybe they can raise hands in the chat box and then or you can write your questions in the chat box or yes. raise your hand if you want to say. I think uh, if you want to ask the questions, participants, you can write in the chat box and uh, or uh, our panelists and our panelists can answer it. Uh, and you can uh, tell who is it addressed to, or if you want to make a comment, general comment, you can. No one is wanting to do anything. I mean, uh, not only students, but any faculty or any other participant would like to say something. You're most welcome to say or react. Samreen wants to say something. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, ma yeah, you can. Yeah. Am I am I audible to everyone? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to both the speakers and, of course, TTC for an insightful uh, session. Uh, my question is actually for uh, Professor Khatri. Um, so I, I really believe that uh, there's a lot to be said and to be found and actually to be unearthed in terms of uh, ecology when we talk about NOIDA because uh, if we try and understand the, the the, exist, the, ex, the morphology that once existed and if we try and trace the the very natural course of water here and uh, so I, just, I was actually interested to uh, know if by any chance any of the uh, students group or anybody in the organization uh, has picked up or is planning to pick up to actually deconstruct the very phenomena of uh, the urban uh, the, of the water bodies which uh, are existence uh, which are existing in these villages for example you in the very beginning when you were showing those maps uh, there was a water body in Bangal that you pointed out so i was actually interested to know that uh, if we've actually been able to trace uh, those uh, those type of water bodies uh, their form their their size and uh, if you've actually been able to understand the kind of uh, details or, uh, I mean, of, of course, when there are water bodies, they have significant memories attached to it and they have uh, events that uh, around it uh, that becomes the path of uh, the formation of memories and it has a certain type of character which changes over a period of time. So what was the character like and what was the ecology like uh, before, uh, you know, urbanization really happened and before uh, Noida came into place or before actually all these sectors that we have today, Noida sandwiched all these urban villages. So what was it like uh, uh, at that point of time and uh, what, have, what has been the transformation? I, I was just interested to know a little bit about that. Thank you. Samreen, uh, this will be taken up in the fifth series when we are discussing the hydrology of Noida, when we are discussing okay. the three water channels. But I must tell you that a lot has happened over this period and even during the course of planning of Noida, there were uh, drains and there were lakes. The whole, uh, this whole portion starting from uh, Trans Yamuna up to Greater Noida it, it is, is a soil type which has got easy water holding capacity. So uh, water catchment is there and starting from Auriflora in Greater Noida, which is still existing, to all the villages which were there, they had water bodies and local histories and interviews with local residents tell us that they had uh, a great connect with those water bodies. In Bhangel, even now there is a water body, uh, which is filled with all sorts of lotuses and once in a while we see them grow. So we will be taking it up in the fifth lecture where we are working on the water in the city. And this would be dealt in detail. Some students have worked on it and we have okay. put it a bit. So I would okay. leave your question for that session because Samreen, if I answer it here and maybe you no, know. No, I understand. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm just interested to know if there's, no, no, there's there is a I lot. Noida has to we'll, be. We'll, we'll all uh, stay tuned to it. So, so it's perfect. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, we have uh, another uh, participant who wants to raise some issues. Mr. Nitin, yeah, can you mute yourself, uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question? 
हेलो हाय इट्स नितिन दिस साइड आई एम अ लोकल रेसिडेंट्स ऑफ नोएडा आई है आई एम इनटू द वाटर प्यूरिफिकेशन इंडस्ट्री सो बेसिकली वी आर फ्रॉम नोएडा एंड वी रिसेंटली मूव फ्रॉम आवर विलेज टू द सेक्टर एरिया राइट देयर इज देयर इज सो मेनी इश्यूज रिगार्डिंग दैट रिगार्डिंग टू द रोड वाटर नो जॉब सिक्योरिटी हॉस्पिटल्स पार्क्स there is so many things are like even the roads are not there in uh, uh, the village area so that's why we move to the this thing but uh, i have a very big question regarding to that is ki how many people are able to move from uh, villages to the urban areas so people are there and uh, they are facing every day uh, problems because there is no safe water nothing like the government is given us so many of prom- uh, promises to give them free hospitalization per, uh, uh, particular percentage into the schools uh, jobs and all that but now the government is not doing anything for the villagers so they have taken the land and some of the lands they have changed the land use as well sir so for that context i would say uh, uh, we have to figure out something regarding to that one as well right nitin i agree that there uh, this is the other phase of development you know uh, nitin is nitin is known to me he is the son of a sarpanch and uh, his uh, grandfather was the sarpanch of sarfabad and uh, he has been discussing these questions to me that is why i shared the link with him and i wanted him to come and hear that we are trying to do something he is correct that the odd phase of development wherein the development authorities had had made certain promises and uh, they did or did not deliver is, is a separate issue but in today's day they don't even have safe drinking water inside the villages leave aside any other facility or municipal uh, well being so the situation is quite stiff and it causes a class conflict and the class class conflict is very very dense they all dislike the new settlers the developed areas and despite that they have to work so a solution to urban villages would also even out a lot of other anguishes thank you sir uh, anitin i mean just to add i had also mentioned that you know yeah i mean you're right basically the problem uh, happens is that there are in a like i think what manish was also trying to say that we are trying to look at these two areas as different areas they're not integrated in our planning system in our planning so these areas which are basically urban villages are relegated from the planning so they are not able to reap the benefit of the development or the infrastructure that the new areas are unlike what he also mentioned unlike in the western period where western uh, countries where urban villages actually become sought after because they are areas which are uh you know less dense there are much more calm people go to them to stay they will still go i mean you know in telford was about 10 12 kilometers away from the village i was living called brookdale everybody worked there but in the evening everybody came back because the the uh, the kind of uh, lifestyle Uh, that you could uh, spend in these villages was far better because you know you don't want to be in a polluted uh, city or with the the kind amount of stress uh, and then this was a la- i mean people were looking for a la- uh, sort of uh, easy life uh, mm-hmm. better uh, better living conditions were there unlike here where there is a complete reversal yeah and I, you know and also i think you know there there is a trend there is a trend uh, of course because of delhi pollution several people started to move a little bit in the outskirts and farm houses but they were again gated communities and now also people are saying that even for pandemic uh, some people are sort of trying to move out away from the city because you know the cities are started to become uh almost uh, unlivable because of several reasons but i think our urban villages are not geared up to be able yeah, to accept right. those people you know i mean if i go to my village you know i i may not like you rightly said do not have the same drinking water may not even have internet so how do i work from home 
So this is the point I think that we have an opportunity in form of these urban villages. If infrastructure, if uh, certain things are as as equivalent to an urban area, they will be much more sought after. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, definitely we have to think about and we have to do something for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, bud. Anybody uh, else? One more question from Rishabh Kunja. Yeah, okay. Uh, he is uh, asking this question to Mr. Manish Chalana. Uh, he wants to know that uh, what's, what are his opinion about Chandigarh and uh, its planning and uh, uh, its... Uh, a uh, way of treating urban villages there right as he already told uh, all the villages were uh, sacked and the uh, planning was done now he is saying he is uh, studying masters in architecture uh, in chandigarh college of architecture and uh, he wants his uh, thoughts on uh, the uh, the western principles of planning are taught as a go to guide for any planning and yours which one has to carry in indian context so what are his thoughts basically uh, uh, this is a this is a loaded question so i'll try to answer it uh, uh, my thoughts are that you know i'm i'm not saying that there's no merit in western ways of thinking uh, or and planning there's a lot there's a lot of good things in 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 the western ways of planning uh, i'm i'm just saying that it is time that we we also take stock of of what is sort of the indigenous ways of planning right and our education system is largely such that we don't dwell much on that we're not taught i can't even think of a book that's available on you know in traditional ways of urban planning you know i mean yes you read about indus valley civilization and you read some models about planning and after that you know uh, it's just you know you immediately move to mogul which is also good you think about you know how moguls were thinking about about cities and rajputs and stuff so there is there is ways of thinking about you know the dwelling its organization and then how the dwellings then create neighborhoods and then how neighborhoods create cities so in chandigarh as you know it's a it's a, it's a very uh, clear example of modernist planning it's a, it's a grid neighborhood unit uh, and uh, uh, so and there are examples like burail and other urban villages now that that defy that categorization that resist that kind of planning and one could say that you know uh, you hear burail being described as kachra right because you know uh, the, because of its hyper uh, development and its congestion and uh, and sanitation and and such but but there are of course problems in burail but then there are also a lot of merits in burail you know it's it 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 brings high density in non high rise urban form rather uh, brilliantly right which is what is suited for tropical climates you know we end up designing high rise towers which are really not suited for tropical climates imagine trying to cool those uh, buildings in in the summer months and how much artificial uh, uh, energy you would need uh, for that so burail has benefits uh, so if you're if you're thinking about how might you be able to uh, think about uh, urban villages in chandigarh i think uh, uh, it would again be how how do you think about urban villages as part of the city not apart from the city and then you know how do you how do you not have them as a separate layer on the master plan how do you have them on the same layer and see how they intersect how do you not silo them and you know we in the way that you know some of these urban villages have evolved in 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 the delhi ncr it is planners to be blamed right i mean we pushed we pushed industries there we pushed all the density there we you know and of course we, you know there were communities that we we taken their farming land and uh, what would they do they would have to redevelop whatever land they had and rely on rents and other things so there's a lot of bad planning that has happened that led to urban villages being where they are so we have created the problem and now we are going to try to solve the problem so you have to think about it as you know what might be the best way uh, to think about uh, these villages 
Uh, of course, one way would be the modernist way of tabula rasa, go and bulldoze everything and redesign urban villages. That's one extreme. The other extreme would be do nothing, which is also an extreme because, you know, these are, these are, these are, these options are not viable and would not benefit anybody. So there's a, there's a solution that's somewhere in between not doing anything and completely clearing out the urban village. It is like, you know, it is a, a good instance is again, Patrick Giri's uh, conservative surgery, which he thinks about, you know, the rural urban interface. How do you go into the urban villages with this idea of conservative surgery and how do you retain non-traditional patterns that might still be there? And then how do you also understand uh, traditional urban form, even though they may look modern in their appearance because they use modern materials, but they might retain traditional sort of, you know, uh, patterns of uh, uh, networking and other things. So there's a lot of study, an in-depth level of messy studies that need to go into these urban villages to fully understand first what they are. Like I said, they're not easily categorized. And before, once you figure out what they are, only then you can even begin to address those, right? So that is in a roundabout way, I hope I answered uh, mm -hmm. some of the questions. Well, there was another question, I think towards the beginning, which says, is this where the slums are? So I think maybe, um, I think slum, because we know slum has a different uh, typology, at least a planning typology. This is also an interesting question that we equate these areas as slums. Mm -hmm. And so I, I suppose if you can answer that, Manish, as well, I mean, the difference between a slum and an urban village. Right. So these are not, these are not, yeah, they, it's not, uh, you know, these are not notified slums, clearly. They are, they, as you said, their slums are different categorization as such, right? So these are, these are urban villages, and you all know it's Lal Dora, Badi, and such, right? So they do, I mean, to answer that question, they do intersect, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you will see that, you know, of course, if you go back, if you peel the layers of uh, uh, built history in urban village, you might go back to the traditional setting of the Ramaya Vastavaya. It may be there, right? It may be, I don't know. So, but, but think about it, you know, 300 years ago, it might have been that, but over time, there are multiple layers that keep adding to it, right? And, and then more recently, there's also that, informality that you see in slums, you begin to see in urban villages, right? That's mm -hmm. why people confuse urban village with, with slum, because, you know, there's some of that makeshift type of development, you know, make do uh, with found objects and sort of, you know, roughly tuned pieces of lumber and stuff to create dwellings. So that's why people have begun to see many of these urban villages as, as, as slums. And there's, there's an intersection uh, spatially, but I think uh, in terms of its uh, social networks, they may be more, uh, I don't know, they, they don't necessarily align with the slums. They probably are as much part of the city as, much, as you know, modern formal city as they are with the informal city. So if I, I were to put it there somewhere between the informal, which is the slum and formal, which is New Delhi. So it's somewhere in between a categorization where they take from both and in the process become both or become neither, right? So they become their own thing. Any other questions, Amitesh? Uh, there's one, Nikki, uh, she or he uh, might wants to ask if there's any work from the government going on regarding our discussion here, the problem that we discussed. So actually, uh, none of the governments are doing, authorities are trying to do what we discussed here. What sir used a metaphor of, uh, for coconut. I think that's the most apt thing uh, uh, that I'm taking here uh, with me. That's a new thing that I heard that we are brown from the outside, but inside we are all white. We are, uh, I read uh, an article from AGK Menon sir, and it was about the same thing that we are following all the Western planning uh, things in Indian context. So uh, here, when she asks uh, that uh, any government is doing, uh, all the authorities are doing something to upgrade um, urban villages, but not in the holistic manner. As Sir Manish Chalana sir said, he is not trying to integrate in the planning perspective, but to uh, silo them and uh, treat them differently. Problem is this. Uh, probably uh, Adhan Khatri sir will be able to 
um, put some light on uh, Anand, uh, Anand sir. Uh, yeah. On light on uh, this uh, urban village we studied here in Noida. The problem was something like this only. Hmm. No, no. I what I have to say here is that see, there is no government activity right now. The uh, the development authorities are trying. DDA has tried its level best, but not much has come out. So uh, instead of uh, actually engaging actively with the government, we must uh, see these studies as positive contributions to our hmm. understanding of architecture first, and to be able to raise relevant questions and uh, create a repository so that we are able to pose concrete uh, you know uh, questions to them or give them some concrete uh, things to work on it is about creating a lot of uh, activity and noise around these areas and also inculcating consciousness in in our in our students who mm. would be the heads of uh, development authorities and who would be uh, you know in important positions in the times to come so that they carry that yeah. sensitivity so that is the whole idea you know so that's about it and then and then really what does you know what does bangal really want to be right and and who 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 gets to decide what bangal wants to be right we from our vision bangal should become this it should be it should be sanitized it should be clean the transportation should be taken care of right perhaps it might if we use romantic uh, uh, lenses it might return to or retain some of its traditional patterns right but perhaps the residents don't want that they want to embrace modernity hyper modernity and you know want to partake in the benefits of the uh, the economic uh, opportunities that it brings then how do you balance that you know because you can't just say that i'm an expert i know what you want they're not going to listen to you because within the parameters of laldora they're still able to do that so then how do you go about about doing so that would again require surveys to understand what bhangel wants what bhangel mm -hmm. wants to be how does it imagine itself how does it visualize itself in 20 years 50 years down the line right true true i mean it's also about taking informed decision you know i mean they they could be aspirations but sometimes they they may be misplaced um, i mean so but it's also to empower those community to take informed decisions about themselves you know they may be seeing i mean they may be aspiring to a high rise because they think that is what that's what the solution to all the problem is but then somebody also needs to tell that what are the problems in the high rise and you know how you are better off so okay fine maybe tomorrow they may decide eventually they will find with the high rise and live with those problems rather than these problems that they're living but then there should be a way of empowering these uh, people to take more informed decision absolutely yeah right i think we've come uh, to an end uh, so i i mean uh, on behalf of everyone i would like to thank uh, all the speakers especially manish lana who is almost burning his midnight uh, lamps if, uh, in his uh, urban village of seattle uh, i don't know what oil you use there but anyways so, <laughs> and uh, i hope it <laughs> so import from india i hope so <laughs> and, uh, and uh, priti ma'am uh, uh, now i'll request her yeah, to so, yeah i mean the, and and we we'll we have the contact we will look forward to seeing you again and we will request priti to do a formal closing and a vote of thanks over to you priti thank you sir and, uh, uh, i priti naya on behalf of school of architecture dtc would like to extend my and from our side a word of thanks to all the participants uh, this webinar is an initiative to address our problems uh, of the city and the urban villages within our uh, cities and uh, the problems they are facing it is a series of five webinars and uh, in collaboration with uvct i would like to extend my thanks to dr chalana and uh, professor anand khatri sir who have started the series with a Uh, with a very uh, pinning questions to address to and to uh, get us sensitized towards these issues uh, in our own cities because uh, i feel that all the work that has to be done should start from our own house only 
and uh, together with i would like to extend my gratitude to our vc uh, ma'am and vice Chan uh, vice chairman sir uh, for guiding and encouraging us uh, throughout this whole pr uh, process i would also like to thank uh, um, dr ranjit verma our director institute uh, because he has uh, given us the opportunity to initiate these kind of webinars and also um, nevertheless for our uh, own uh, director sir dr uh, uh, dwesh sir because he is the one who has uh, actually encouraged us and given us a thought that this is a very uh, prime uh, uh, aspect of our uh, urban areas that we have to issue we have to understand their issues and deal with it and uh, the next webinar uh, which will be uh, conducted will be on interlinkages twin urban cities of hoshiarpur and gitorni thank you very much before we end i would like to also extend my thanks to our dean pranay ma'am who just joined us uh, towards the end yes pranay uh, ma'am has been very pranay. instrumental and supportive thank you pranay ma'am so and thank you everyone so we look forward i was uh, there since since starting i was there i just oh. missed few minutes in between oh. Oh, oh all right, man. Wonderful. <laughs> so yes, yeah, good, good to uh, have you here. Uh, I'm very happy. Thank you, you so much, sir. In. And thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, your support and encouragement always. And like also our director, institute director, sir, is always very, very supportive of everything that we do, like the management as well. So look forward for the next announcement. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day and take care and be safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.